baby on the deal. Right, so today is the sort of the, the next chapter on the current year protocols. So now we're we'll talking about a, a alternative to two phase locking called timestamp ordering concurrency control. So just as a reminder for everyone, homework one is due a week from today on the 12th. Project three is due two weeks from today on the 19th, which will be before the Thanksgiving deadline, or sorry, Thanksgiving holiday. And I was debating whether to give it to you before or after Thanksgiving. The TAs convinced me that doing it before Thanksgiving so you relax during Thanksgiving was, was the right thing to do. If that's not the right thing for you, if you feel like that was the wrong thing, email them and complain, okay? Um, all right, so just to understand where we're at, what we're talking about again, is the first lecture on currency control was all about understanding what serializability means, right? To have a serializable schedule, complex serializability versus view serializability. And then last class, we talked about two-phase locking. And two-phase locking was a concurrent control protocol that we would use. Yes, yeah, sorry. That'll be at the end. Yeah. So previous class, we skipped isolation levels and uh, and and phantoms. That's the end of this. So you don't need to understand isolation levels or phantoms to understand what we're talking about today. It's sort of like extra. Okay. All right. So again, last class was was two phase locking, and I said this was a runtime protocol. You needed to understand uh, to, to for the system to use at runtime to generate schedules on the fly that would end up being serializable, right? Because in the real world, we connect with, with our application and we start issuing requests. We don't the data system doesn't have the full schedule ahead of time, so it has to order these operations uh, in a programmatic way to make sure that you don't have conflicts. So that's what two phase locking does. So timestamp ordering now is is an alternative approach. Uh, that will produce the same effect, right? It'll generate schedules at runtime for transactions that are uh, serializable. So the way to think about these at a high level is that two-phase locking protocols are considered pessimistic concurrent protocols, meaning they assume the transactions are going to have conflicts, and therefore they require them to acquire locks before they're allowed to read and write any object in our database. So I get the lock on the thing that I want to access, before I can access it. Timestamp ordering is, is considered an optimistic protocol because um, we assume there's not going to be any conflicts. And we'll just later on at the end when transactions go to conflict as we go along, we don't require and require any locks as they run. At the end, we figure out whether this was the right thing to do or not. Right? So now this is today's class, we're focusing on the second one. And what's going to be really confusing about this is that these the protocols we're talking about today are a part of a broad class of concurrency protocols based on timestamps, that are timestamp ordering protocols. But there'll be a protocol specifically called the timestamp ordering protocol. Furthermore, there will also be another protocol specifically, specifically called the optimistic concurrency control protocol. So both basic timestamp ordering and optimistic concurrency control are examples of timestamp ordering protocols, and they're both examples of optimistic protocols. That is extremely confusing, and I apologize, it's the way it is, but I'll as we go along, I'll hopefully clarify things. All right, so the basic idea of any timestamp ordering protocol is that we're going to use timestamps that we assign to transactions determined to determine the serializability order of their operations. Right? And so basically, when we think about this, be, we'll introduce a new function called TS. So we have a transaction TI and TJ. So we say the timestamp of TI, if the timestamp of TI is less than TJ, then the database system is going to ensure that it generates a schedule at runtime where the, 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 the interleaving or the final state of the database of the interleaved operations is equivalent to one where we execute them in serial order where TI became, came before TJ. Right? So TI is going to have an a, a, a older timestamp or a smaller timestamp than TJ, and that's going to be like as if we had a serial order where we execute TI first followed by TJ. So the way we're going to generate these timestamps are, are the way these timestamps are essentially these unique fixed counters or numbers that we're going to have per transaction, and it always has to be monotonically increasing. I mean, our timestamps always need to be marching forward in time. We can never have timestamps go back in time, right? Because this this will mess everything up. So. Again, we're going to say this TS function will, t will use to determine what the timestamp that we've allocated to, to, time stamp, to, to transaction TI. And then an important aspect of this is that 
the timestamp is not actually the time of when the transaction showed up in the system or when it started executing. So we'll see the first protocol, they're going to assign timestamps when the transaction begins. The second protocol we'll look at will only assign timestamps when the transaction goes to, goes to commit. Right, because that's just how these protocols work. So just, it's not the timestamp of when I showed up. So in this class, this is, again, this is the intro class, we're going to assume that every transaction has one timestamp. In the sort of advanced class, we'll actually look at some protocols where you can actually have a timestamp of when you begin and when you commit. But for our purposes here, we, we don't need to worry about that for now. So there are a bunch of different ways we can generate these timestamps. Right? The most obvious one is we just ask the system clock, you know, what's the current time in, in milliseconds or microseconds, and we use that to assign that to, the, uh, to, the, you know, to each transaction. So every transaction shows up, we need a new timestamp, we check what the current time is, and we give it to it. What's one problem with this? We just had it this weekend. Daylight savings, right? So we start assigning transactions uh, in order uh, based on the current time, and then all of a sudden we have we have we have to roll back, to, you know, the clocks by an hour, or it's a you know leap year or leap second in you know at the end of the year. Then this is going to screw up this scheme, right? So another approach is to use a logical counter, and this is just I have you know I have a, a single variable and I add one to it every single time I hand out a new a new timestamp to a transaction. What's one problem with this? Using a logical counter. Yes? Well, eventually, I think the counter is going to get too big, and then it might have overflow. Perfect. Yeah, he got, he got one out of the two issues. The first issue is that, as he said, the timestamp will get, you know, if it's a 64 bit timestamp, it'll take a while. But a 32 bit timestamp, as soon as you hit 2 to 32 minus 1, it'll have to roll over back to, to 0. And now you all of a sudden you have transactions that have timestamps that are less, you know, that look like they're in the past, even though they're really in the future. And that messes things up. We'll see how to fix that next, next, next class. Another issue with this is like, say I'm on a distributed system, right? How do I, if I have transactions showing up on different machines, how do I keep those two counters in sync? And that gets expensive. So there's not one magical way. The most typical way that people actually do this is usually a hybrid clock. Uh, it's a combination of a physical clock, like the system, system clock and the, the CPU, and then a, a logical counter. Uh, Postgres will do a logical counter. And again, it'll have the, the wraparound issue. We'll talk about that next, next time. All right, so today's agenda, we're going to first start off talking about the basic timestamp ordering protocol. Right? And again, this is what I was saying before. These are all timestamp ordering protocols, but I'm recalling one, the basic timestamp ordering protocol, and that's a very specific algorithm. Then we'll talk about OCC, or the Optimistic Occurrence Control Protocol. And again, all of these are optimistic, uh, but this one is explicitly called the Optimistic Occurrence Control Protocol. Then we'll talk about the partition-based timestamp ordering, and then we'll finish up with what he was asking about uh, before. It's like we didn't discuss isolation levels and phantoms in the last class, and we'll, we'll finish up with that. Okay? All right, so let's jump right into this. So the basic timestamp ordering protocol, the way it's going to work is that uh, we're going to allow transactions to read and write objects in our database without locks. And now every object in the database is now going to include a, two additional fields to keep track of the, the timestamp of the last transaction that read the object and the timestamp of the last transaction that wrote to the object. So in this protocol, we're getting timestamps of when the, uh, when the transaction show up in the system. Right? So when I arrive, I get my timestamp. And so I can use that to figure out what, this, what the serializable ordering is for, for my operations are. So every single time now, I'm going to do a read and write. I have to first check the read write timestamps of the objects I'm trying to access to see whether I'm allowed to do that. Right? And the, the idea here is that these timestamps are always moving forward in time. And we want to make sure that our transaction is not allowed to read or write anything from, from the future. And if we see that we're violating this timestamp ordering, then the data system will abort our transaction. So there's two cases we need to handle, right? You have to handle reads and you have to handle writes. So the protocol for reads is that I check my timestamp, and if my timestamp is less than the, uh, the write timestamp of the object I'm reading, then I know that there's some transaction with a higher timestamp than mine that's in the future, even though it's running at the same time I am, it's in the future that has written to this object, and therefore I should not allow to be, 
to see that object or see that, the, the, that, that updated version of that object because I'm actually in the past. My timestamp is less than that, and I wouldn't actually, I should not be able to see that. So the way to sort of think about this is that the, the timestamp says, here's the, the state of the data I should see at, at the timestamp that I showed up. And I can see anything that was, that was modified uh, before I arrived. And so if I see a write from somebody in the future, I shouldn't be able to see that. And therefore, the, 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 the data system will have to abort you and restart. And when you restart, you come back with the same timestamp. Right, so now you're the, you, you know, um, the, you're the older one. Actually, that might be wrong. You actually might want to get, yeah, that actually should be, you come back with a newer timestamp. Ignore that, that's a mistake, sorry. All right, so if, though, if we don't violate this conditional here, then we're allowed to read the object, and then we have to update the read timestamp of the object with either the max of uh, the current read timestamp or our timestamp. Now, one additional thing that isn't, I don't think is in the, in the textbook when it describes the, the timestamp ordering protocol is that in order to make sure you have repeatable reads under this, this, uh, under this scheme, you always have to make a local copy of the object you read uh, after you read it. So that way, if I want to read the same thing again, I can, read, I can read the version that I know that I read that I was allowed to read. For writes, yes, sorry. So this question is, what if the two timestamps are equal to each other? So what does that mean? What's that? Oh, sorry, sorry. You're saying if, if, if oh, sorry, if this timestamp is, is equal to this? So what, yeah, so, so who, who wrote to it? Right, so there might be two transactions that are writing, writing to the object, but your example is TS, the timestamp of TI is equal to the write timestamp of X. What does that mean? Who wrote to X? Anyway, yes. TI, exactly. Again, timestamps are unique. It's uniquely identifying my transaction. I said that in the beginning. So if the write timestamp is equal to my timestamp, I wrote to it. Therefore, I'm allowed to read to it. Right? All right, for writes, we have to check to make sure that, uh, that the, um, my timestamp is, uh, is greater than the last timestamp of the transaction that read, to, read the object, right? Because that means, again, some, some transaction is in the future and has read the older version, but I'm overwriting that version, and they should have seen my write, but they didn't because I didn't make the, make the write yet, right? So if this is violated, or if I'm trying to overwrite a change that, from a transaction that was in the future for me, right? so now I'm, I'm in the past and I'm over trying to write, a, write in the future, so my old version now becomes the, the latest version, that's not allowed to happen either. So in this case, I have to abort. All right? But if I don't violate these things, then I'm going to update the write timestamp with, with my timestamp. And same thing, if I want to make sure that I can have repeatable reads or read my own writes, I have to make a copy of the object I read and put it into my you know, private workspace. Yes? So, if the table has a billion of tuples, how do you keep a local copy? So he says, if the, if the, the table has a billion copies, how do you keep a local copy? You have to make a billion copies. Right? So the, the, the memory you'd back for this private workspace would have to be backed by the buffer pool manager so that you can swap it out the disk if necessary. Yes? His question, is, his question is, why do we actually need a local copy? So if I, if I write to an object, right? I'm, I, I'm, I'm overwriting the, the, the oldest version. I don't violate these conditionals, so that's OK. Then now, a transaction in the future that's still active, that's still running the same time I'm running, it's going to end up writing that object. It's going to overwrite my write. But if I want to be able to read my own write and not have to abort, then I can make a local copy and I can then read it again. You don't have to do this. This prevents you from unnecessarily aborting. This is like an extra thing you, that you don't have to do. And also, we'll see the same idea in, in OCC in a second. Right? Because again, if I don't have a local copy and I try to read my, thing, my, my object again, I would come back here and my timestamp would be less than the right timestamp of the transaction that overwrote in the future. 
and therefore I would abort. So by making a local copy, I, I avoid this, this problem here. Actually, we can see like these transactions is completed at this particular timestamp and with no time span. Wait, say it again? You, you can view this as what, sorry? As like this transaction takes no time to compute. Because he, all the data he writes will happen exactly at the time span. All right, so his comment is that um, with timestamp ordering, you can think of a transaction as taking actually zero time because you get one timestamp, then all your updates get a, have the same timestamp. So it's as if, as if all of a sudden psh, your magic, all your stuff magically is there. That's what it looks like from, from the outside world. That's what serial ordering gives you, the serializable schedule gives you. It looks like things are happening in serial order. But in reality, we have to interleave these operations because we can't magically have these changes just occur all at once. Now, the, the partition-based TO, we'll see in a second, at the end, essentially does this. Uh, but our purpose is here, we have interleaving and we have to handle that. All right, so let's look at an example. All right, so we have T1, T2, right? Uh, they're gonna be T1's gonna be read A, read A, sorry, read B, read A. T2 is gonna read B, write B, read A, write A. So, the thing to point out now, how, over here now in our, or, sorry, we sign our transactions, timestamps T1, T1 gets timestamp 1, T2 gets timestamp 2. Over here in our, uh, in our, in our database, we see that we're, we now have the read timestamp and the write timestamp for our transactions. So our transaction starts, single thread, you know, single core, single thread, so we can only execute one operation at a time. T1 starts, it does the read on B, and again, here our read and write timestamps for our database objects are all zero. So assume that some, you know, some transaction with timestamp zero bulk loaded everything. So the very first thing we do is read on B. So we update now its read timestamp to be one. T2 then starts, does the read on B. Same thing, we update the read timestamp on B to now be two, because that's the, the timestamp we got when our transaction started. Then we do the write on B, update its write timestamp to be two. Switch back over to do the read on A, update the read timestamp to be one, back to read A again, and re to update it to two, because again, we're always moving forward in time. Do the write on A, update it to two, then we both commit, and there's no violations of the timestamp ordering protocol. So we're, we're allowed to finish here. All right, is this clear? As you go along, you have to update these, these, you're always checking the read and write timestamps inside of the, the, the database for the objects you're reading or modifying. And as long as your timestamp does not violate the conditionals I showed before, then you're allowed to do the operation. Yes? How do we determine the initial timestamp of T1 being 1, T2 being 2? So his question is, how did I determine that the timestamps being assigned to T1 and T2 were 1 and 2? Right? Because if we have them the other way, then I think T2 is aborted. Right, so his statement is, if I switch them the other way, then one of these guys would have aborted, T2 would have aborted, right? Yes. So, but for this particular example, I mean, I made it, I made it to be so it doesn't abort. And I'm just saying, like, T1 started, and on the basic timestamp ordering protocol, when you start is when you get your timestamp. So this is just a logical counter, right? T1 started, gets one. Increment the counter by one. T2 starts, get, goes, get the counter, now gets two. It's just adding one when they started. So let's look at an example where they, they would abort. Same thing. T1 starts, does a read on A, we update the read timestamp in the database. T2 starts, we update the, the write timestamp in the database for to be two. Now T1 is gonna try to do a write on A, but we would see that if we try to update the write timestamp for this object, A, the, the timestamp for T1 is one, but the, the write timestamp for A is two. So one is less than two, so we're not allowed to make this modification. We're not allowed to overwrite this change. I'm not even showing what the value is in the database. I don't care. All I care about is these read and write timestamps. That's determined, it's gonna help me determine in what order I can have these operations occur. So when I see this violation of my conditionals, then I have to abort uh, T1. Is this clear? All right, so we talked about this last class. What's one obvious optimization we can, we can make for this? For this particular schedule here. Do we care about actually what the right of that T2 did to A? 
in the final state of the database? Not really, right? Because it, it's going to get overwritten by, by this guy here. But since we have timestamps, and the timestamps are telling us our serial ordering, we actually want to see this, the, this version of A written, not this version here. Right? Because T1 has to occur before T2. So we, there's an optimization we can apply to timestamp ordering protocol called the Thomas Wright rule. Thomas is some <laughs> from the 60s or 70s, whatever. <laughs> um, and so what will happen is we say if, if, like before, we're trying to do a write, if our timestamp is less than the read timestamp, then we have to abort. Because, right? again, that's a transaction in the future, read or object, that we haven't written to yet. So we can't, we can't update it. But if our timestamp is less than the write timestamp of the object, the Thomas Wright rule says we're allowed to just ignore making the write to the, to the database, keep the write in our local uh, buffer, or our local workspace, and allow our transaction to continue. So nobody else will see that write because it would have been overwritten by T2 anyway. Right? So again, this, will vi this technically violates our timestamp ordering protocol, but this really simple optimization allows us to have fewer aborts. So we go back to our example here. Again, read on A, update the read timestamp. Write on A, update the write timestamp. Now come back here. T T1 wants to do a write on A, but we can't because uh, T, you know, the T1's timestamp is 1, which is less than 2. But we're not actually going to update the write timestamp on the object and just ignore the write. Nobody else sees it. And then our transaction is allowed to keep running and, and commit. Pretty simple, right? Okay, it's not the same as blind writes because this is specifically under blind writes. The the last writer always, always is what we end up seeing. In this case here, the last writer technically is T1 in real physical time, but in the logical time based on our timestamps, T1's write actually occurs before T2. So the way to sort of think about what we're talking about here is like there's like this there's a physical time of what how the events actually occur. On, on, this, on the chip when it runs. And then there's the logical time of what the act, outside world actually sees. So the logical time says T1 followed by T2, but in reality, the physical time was T2 followed by T1. And this is all correct. And this is another good example of what I was saying before about how serializable, serializable, uh, serializability allows us to have any possible interleaving we want as long as the end state of the database is equivalent to one where we had a serial ordering. So by doing this interleaving in a certain way, we can, you know, we can get better parallelism. We don't have to abort things unnecessarily, but we may not and may not end up with the state of the data as you would expect. Yes. So like, we still have to keep a local copy of A. Right? So this question is, do we have to keep a local copy of A here? Correct, because otherwise, if I then read this, I had to go read this. I'm not reading my own write. Okay. So the basic time stamp ordering protocol. So it's going to generate schedules that are conflict serializable as long as you don't use the Thomas Wright rule. Um, there won't be any deadlocks like in two-phase locking because it's sort of like deadlock prevention because transactions are checking as they go along whether they're allowed to read and write something and they just abort themselves if they find they're going to violate that ordering. Right? One issue you have in the, in the basic timestamp ordering protocol is that you could have starvation for really long transactions. Because right, I'm aborting any time I'm going to violate my, violate my timestamp ordering. So if my transaction is going to update a billion tuples, and as I'm going along, all these little transactions are coming along and updating one tuple and then committing right away and being done, as my long transaction will get to that, they'll have a, it'll, its timestamp will be less than the, the little guys that came along. So therefore, it'll get aborted and roll back. And, and it'll keep doing this and doing this, and it won't actually ever complete. So I would say, in practice, I don't. I am not aware of any database system that actually does timestamp ordering the way I'm describing here. Uh, we were doing this in our own system in Peloton here at CMU. Uh, that was a bad idea, and we undid that. And we're not doing that anymore. Um, we can talk about offline with, with the, why that, that why that was the case. So the one thing I also talk about now about timestamp ordering is that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to allow schedules that are considered not recoverable. So a recoverable schedule is one where a transaction is only allowed to commit 
when any of the transactions who they've read changes from go ahead and, get, and commits. It's sort of like the cascading rollback stuff we, we talked about before, right? If I, if I read something that was modified by another transaction, then I have to make sure that they commit before I'm allowed to commit, right? Timestamp ordering protocol does not does not allow to do that, or does, does not check this for you, right? And the reason why you want to do this is because if you come back after a crash, you'll be able to have replay all the transactions that, that, that modified the database, and you, you'll end up being able to read those changes again and not worry about them getting rolled back or, or missing. So here's what I mean by this. So in this case here, T1 does a write on A, then T2 does a read on A and write on B. So here, T2 under the basic timestamp ordering protocol is allowed to read the, the write by T1 on A, right? Because T1 is going to have timestamp 1. We update the, 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 the write timestamp. T2 comes along. It reads it. Its, its timestamp is 2, which is greater than 1. So therefore, it's allowed to read this. But then it goes ahead and commits. And we send a response to the outside world, hey, you're, you're done. If now later on T1 aborts, we have to roll back all this change, these changes, right? But we have no way of, of rolling back the changes that T1, sorry, T2 has made and telling the outside world this transaction actually didn't actually commit. So the sort of textbook definition of the basic timestamp ordering protocol would permit this schedule, which is considered not recoverable. And the way you fix this is just maintaining the read-write set of transactions to know that this guy read the modification by this guy. So when it commits, it has to wait until to see this guy actually finishes. Strict two-phase locking fixes this for you, right? Doesn't have this problem because I would get the exclusive lock on A, and I would hold that until I actually finish. So this guy would actually never be allowed to even read it. Right? You can sort of think that's like a speculative read. I think you're going to commit, so let me go ahead and read something that you wrote. And I wait and figure out to see whether I was actually allowed to do that. So the performance issues you have with, with basic timestamp running, running protocol, again, as he asked about what if I update a billion tuples, do I have to have a billion tuples in my, in my workspace? The answer is yes. Right? So you pay this penalty of having to copy everything into your workspace to be able to have to recoverable reads. Uh, you know, uh, Two-phase locking doesn't have this issue because you know, you, you acquire the locks, and then you're allowed to do whatever you want to it, All right? And then we talked about this before, the timestamps, uh, long-running transactions can get starved because their timestamps are going to be in the past, and they can get tripped up by newer transactions that are come and go and update things that, that you're trying to update as well. Okay. So... One observation we can make is that with sort of basic timestamp ordering protocol and two-phase locking, you're kind of making this assumption that conflicts are going to occur, and you're just sort of making sure that nobody causes problems as you go along. Um, optimistic, oh, sorry, uh, the, the time stamp only, basic timestamp ordering protocol is a little more optimistic than, than two-phase locking, but it's still you're checking at every single, every single a modification or access you do. So... What if we made the assumption that conflicts are, are mostly going to be rare and that our transactions are going to be mostly short-lived, meaning they're not going to you know, stick around and do a, a large number of updates. Most of the times, they're only updating a small number of things or reading a small number of records. Right? We talked about this before when we talked about uh, OLTP applications. When you log into Amazon, right, you only access the data for your account. Right? You, you up, maybe update your payment information, update your address, buy some items, right, and make payments and things like that. You're only touching a small number of tuples. It's very, ra you know, it's very rare for a transaction to come along and touch a billion tuples all at once. So if you assume most of your transactions are going to be small and the conflicts are rare, then having to have transactions acquire locks before they do anything or update these read and write timestamps as they go along is actually adding additional overhead for conflicts that are actually never going to occur anyway. So you're sort of being overly cautious. So a, a, a potentially better approach is to optimize for the non-conflict case because that's the most common thing. So this is what the optimistic Kirchhoff protocol does. And again, it's a timestamp ordering based protocol that is optimistic, but it has the name optimistic Kirchhoff protocol. So this is actually was invented here at CMU in, in 1983. 
right? So this is done by H.T. Kong, who is now a professor at Harvard, right? They basically in the 1990s to go fix up Harvard CS because it was a uh, Actually, one of the, the best people, the most, uh, the, the premier expert in the world on concurrency control and transactions was a professor at Harvard, this guy named Phil Bernstein. All the papers and all the seminal work in the late 1970s, early 1980s on transactions was invented by this guy. He got denied tenure from Harvard because they didn't understand what a database was. And so nobody, went ever, nobody ever wanted to go to Harvard for CS as professor because if Phil Bernstein couldn't get tenure, then you know, what chance do I have? So H.T. Kong from away from CM. Right. Well, so the way OCC is going to work is that just like before, we're going to have a private workspace for a transaction. But in the basic timestamp ordering protocol, I said that was optional. And OCC here, you have to have it. That's how, that's how the protocol works. So anytime you're going to read an object, you're going to copy into your private workspace and just read that thing over and over again. Anytime you make a modification, you're at first going to copy it into your workspace and then modify it in your workspace. Then when you go to commit, then the data system has to figure out what changes did you make in your workspace and what are the other transactions that are running right now and, see, and look at their workspace and see if the, whether there's, there's a conflict. If there's no conflicts, then you're allowed to install all your changes in your private workspace into, your, in, into the global database. And then everyone can see your changes now. So the way this is going to work is going to be broken down in three phases. And again, this is more confusing terminology because there's a read phase, a write phase, and, a, and sort of a read phase, validation phase, and a write phase. In the read phase, it's more than just reads. You actually can do reads and writes. Right, for whatever reason, they call it the read phase. So in the read phase, this is when you're going to track all the changes that transactions made or what objects they've read in the private workspace. Then when you go to commit, now you automatically can enter the validation phase. And this is where the data system figures out whether you're, you were, any of the changes you made will conflict with other transactions. And then if, if there's no conflicts, then you enter the write phase, where now you apply all your changes in, from, from your private workspace into the global database. Again, the read phase includes both reads and writes, just to be clear. So let's look at an example. So the first thing to point out is that now in our global database, I got rid of the read timestamp. I only had the write timestamp field because I don't care about what, uh, what the timestamps of the, of the transactions that are reading objects because they're going to do all that down in their private workspace. The other thing I've now I've added in the schedule is these little boxes with these labels for, for the different three different phases, right? Read, write, read, validate, and write. So just like in two-phase locking, when I said, you know, there, there's, you don't really have these explicit lock and unlock commands, the data system does that for you. You don't explicitly tell the data system, oh, put me in the read phase, put me in the, in the validate phase, right? This happens automatically underneath the covers. I'm just showing you the boundaries here to say what's actually, what state the transaction is or what phase the transaction is in at these different time steps. Okay? So we start off, transaction begins, right? And then it automatically enters the, right, the read phase. And this is when we'll instantiate a private workspace for our, our transaction, right? And initially it, it's empty. And as I said to Amadou, this private workspace is going to be backed by the buffer pool manager because if we get too big and you know, we, we run out of memory, we, we want to be able to swap this out to disk. So now the T1 is all, is all set up and ready to go. So it does the read on A. And so what we're going to do is we're going to copy the current value of A from the global database into our private workspace. We'll also include the, the write timestamp. So then now we do a context switch. T2 starts. Again, it enters the read phase. It begins with uh, instantiating its, its work, private workspace. And then we do a read on A, and we copy that into our private workspace. So now the transaction is going to tell the data system to commit. So I know I'm drawing commit here. This is sort of meant to be when the database system says you're actually committed. But assume from the terminal or, or from the application, I'm telling the data system, go ahead and commit me. So when this occurs, now we automatically enter the validate phase. And we, we need to figure out whether we have any conflicts in any of the transactions. So at this point here, when we enter the validate phase, this is actually when the data system will provide us a, a timestamp. 
So again, to point out here, T1 started first, T2 started second, but T2 entered the validation phase first before T1, so therefore T2 gets timestamp 1. And that's the serial ordering we, we want to guarantee with this. So we do our validation phase. It's super easy to do because this guy has only read this object, and this, no, this guy didn't read that. Sorry, this guy only read it, and this guy only read it. There's no, you know, no such thing as a read-read conflict, so we're fine. So we pass the validation phase. Then we do enter the write phase, where we can apply any changes we made to the global database. But again, this is a read-only transaction, so there's no changes made. So we go ahead and just commit our transaction and blow away its private workspace. Then we switch back over to T1. It does the write on A. So now, again, we're going to apply our change directly into our private workspace here. But the thing to point out is that I've updated the value, and I had to update the write timestamp, but I set the write timestamp to be infinity. Why? Exactly. You don't know when T1's commit. You, at this point, you don't have a timestamp. Right? In the read phase, transactions don't have timestamps. So you set it to infinity. Right? Some, you know, some forever long distant, you know, point in the future. Then we enter the validate phase. We get now our timestamp T2. So now we can go back and when we apply the, so we do our validation. Still haven't set our timestamp in, in here yet. Still infinity. But if we pass now the validation phase, and we do our write, then we update the, the global database, and now here we set our timestamp to be 2. Right? So at, at a high level, this is clear. Obviously, I'm being very hand wavy on the validation phase, but we'll, we'll go over that in more detail next. OK. So validation. Again, the basic idea here is that the data system is going to ensure that it only permits serializable schedule, schedules for our interleaved operations. So what's going to happen is the transaction that wants to commit that's in the write phase is going to check with other transactions that are active to see whether it has any read-write or write-write conflicts. And if it does, it's going to make sure that those conflicts are always going in one direction. So you can have different types of validation. You can have forward direction and, and, and reverse direction. We're only going to go in one direction to keep it really simple here. All right, so we're going to say that older transactions uh, don't conflict with younger transactions. And if we do, then, then we abort ourselves. So that means we only need to check what other, what other active transactions are, are happening right now. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to have to have a global view of all the transactions that are active. And we have to uh, allow our internal database system, the threads, to be able to go inside the private workspace and see what they have in there. Right? So. We're going to keep track of the read-write sets of the transactions, which we're doing anyway in our, in our private workspace. And then we just go to see whether our read-write set conflicts with the read-write set of other transactions. Sorry, if our write set conflicts with the read-write set of other transactions. So for our purpose here, just to understand the protocol, we're going to do this, what's called serial validation. So we're going to have a big fat latch in front of the, uh, the, the validation phase. And only one transaction can do validation at a time, just to keep it simple to understand the protocol. In a more complex scenarios, in, in sort of real systems, you actually can do this validation in parallel. But it's a, a little bit more complicated, and we're, we're not going to cover that here. But for our purposes, again, only one transaction is, is in, in the validation phase. For the write phase, it doesn't actually have to be single-threaded. You actually can just order the writes in such a way that you don't have any conflicts or deadlocks. Um, but for our purposes, we, we don't care for, for understanding the protocol at this point either. All right, so again, and we enter the validation phase. Transactions will get a timestamp. And then we're going to check to see whether, uh, our committing, uh, whether our transaction conflicts with all other actively running transactions as well. And so if our timestamp TI is less than a timestamp of another transaction, TJ, and again, TJ is going to be uh, the Actively running transactions are not in the validation phase, so they're running, and so their, their write timestamp is infinity. So, it's, so basically, if our, if our assigned timestamp is less than infinity, meaning they've written something that we, they don't have a timestamp yet, and that's why they're always in the future, then the one of the following three conditions must hold in order for, for our transaction TI to pass the validation phase. So the first one's most obvious, right? If TI completes for TJ even begins, 
then TI is allowed to commit, right? So here TI starts, right? Does does read write, do read validate write, then it commits and it's done, right? T2 starts, does read validate write. At no point did, did T2 start before T1 started or got through the validate and write phase. So there can never possibly be a conflict here, right? This is sort of trivial, right? This is, this is just serial ordering. That's all this means. The way to think about this, though, is like, again, I'm showing two transactions, but now I think if you had hundreds of transactions actively at the same time. So you could figure this out and say, I don't conflict with this other transaction and I'm done. The other issue, the other condition would be that if TI is going to complete before TJ, before TJ starts its write phase, and TI does not have, uh, has not written to any object that has been read by TJ, Right, you take the right set, intersect it with the read set. If the, inter if the intersection is empty set, then I know I don't have any conflicts. So, th so therefore, I, I, I'm allowed to pass. Uh, er, TI does not conflict with TJ, and TI would be allowed to commit in reference to TJ. So going back here, right? We've, we've been running for a while. We have some. We have some objects that are. Uh, t we want TI to T1 to commit. T2 has only read an object uh, A. So when we go do our validation. We check to see is the right set, does the right set conflict with the read set of this other transaction? In this case, yes, right? Because they this guy read A, this guy, this guy wrote A, this guy read A. So in this case here, we would have to board T1, even though T2 is never going to actually modify this object and didn't actually even read, you know, wouldn't actually read our write. Right? Because again, T2 is still active when T1 is trying to commit. T1, uh, T, T1 has an intersection on the read set with the write set. Therefore, T1 shouldn't be allowed to commit. Because what would happen here, right? If I was allowed to commit T1, I would apply my change into the global database, but, and I would get timestamp 1. This guy would go to validate and, and com commit. And it would get time allocated timestamp 2. But... It didn't actually read the object that was written at timestamp one. It read the object that was written at timestamp zero. So it missed that write from, from T1. So that's why T1 is going to have to abort, because T2 would, will miss that write. Right? The, older, the, 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 the older transactions, older, again, the timestamp being higher, they should not miss any updates from, from sorry, older transactions where the timestamp is lower, they should not be able to write to anything that a newer transaction would end up missing. All right, so we go back into our example here again. If we now we just switch around the validation order here. So T1 end up validating first. Before it does the write phase, though, T1 does a validation phase. And now this case here, the, the, the t this transaction is timestamp 1. This is timestamp 2. 2 is greater than 1. So therefore, that's OK if we can apply our chains. Because we know that T2 would not write. It did not miss the modification that uh, T2 wrote, because it wouldn't have seen it anyway, even though it occurred physically after the modification of A in T1. So therefore, that's a correct uh, serializable ordering. I'm seeing blank, blank faces. Is this clear? And this is a good example of the difference between logical time and physical time. Logically, T2 commits first. Physically, T1 wrote to A first before T2 read to it. But that's OK, because logically, T2 will commit after T1. Right? So this, we did it right here. It occurred in our private workspace. We do a read on A, but we read it from the global database. We didn't see this change. And then we're allowed to commit, because we, we, you know, we wouldn't have seen this right anyway, based on the logical, logical ordering of the timestamps. Yes. I knew you weren't the only one. So thank you. I knew you. I knew you weren't the only one that didn't understand. Yeah. Keep going. So, so you're saying like T two reads from T one, actually. No, no, no. T two. So here. So say I start. I do a read on A, bring it down my 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 workspace. Do a write on A. I update in here. Now I do a context switch. This guy starts. He does a read on A. He gets the state of the data, the state of A from the database here at timestamp zero, brings it down to our private workspace. Now we do a validate. 
We're a read-only transaction. We don't conflict with anybody, so we're allowed to, to complete the validation, and then we end up, we end up to the right phase. We'll, we'll pending for the right phase. So now, when this guy goes to validate, he's going to get timestamp 2. This guy got timestamp 1. Physically, the write to A occurred before the read to A. This guy wrote to it first physically, then this guy read it, but he read the version up here. So then now, because this guy does not conflict with this, because this guy's in the past, he's allowed to install his change. So again, this is a good example where the physically things occur in one way, but the end state of the database is logically in, an, in another ordering. Yes, correct, yes. So his statement is, doesn't matter whether the, this read A occurs before or after this write, because it's the change that T1 is going to make always lands in the private workspace, and T2 will never actually see that change. So this is what the private workspace does for us. OK. All right, so the final validation step is that our transaction TI is going to complete its read phase before TJ, TJ completes its read phase. Um, and our write set does not conflict with the read or write set of, of the other transaction. Right, sort of extension of what we had before. So we go back here. All right, so this guy is going to do a read on A and write on A. This guy does a read on B and write on, read on B, read on A. So here we end up into our validation phase. We get timestamp 1. Then we check to see whether we have a conflict with anybody else. This guy read something, but he didn't read A. So that's fine. So at this point here, it's safe to commit. And then T1 will come along, and it does the read on A. right? So again, apply our change to the global workspace. Then we do a read on A here, and it's going to get the version that this guy had, had written. And again, that's correct, right? because it's seeing the state of the database logically after T1 has already committed, because T, T2 has not committed yet. Now, I am being some hand wavy in some ways about how the changes get applied in the right phase, right? Like, what if this guy updated five, five tuples, and I do my read, and I end up reading the first two before the other three have been applied? Right? You have to use latching to, to prevent that, or additional checks to prevent that. But that's, that's, we, don't, we don't care about that at this point. Yes? His question is, I'm assuming that two transactions are issued by two different threads. Y yes, two different connections are sending these, these requests. But in my example here, I only have one core, one thread actually running the transactions. OK, so OCC works really well when the number of conflicts is low. Because yes, I'm copying things, but the, uh, I'm not checking every single step along the way as I read and write stuff, I'm only checking at the very end. So if I don't have a lot of conflicts, then this is this me faster than two-phase locking because I don't have this all this extra overhead of acquiring locks uh, as I go along. The downside, though, is that if the, the database is large and, uh, sorry, the database is, if the, the right set of transactions or the, the working space of transactions, what tuples are they accessing is small, and I have a lot of conflicts, then I'm going to ex basically execute all my transactions, do all the queries in my transaction, and then at, only at the end do I figure out whether I have a conflict. So if I have to update 1,000 tuples, and then it's, and the, those updates are expensive, it's only when I get to the very end and I actually go to commit that I realize, oh shit, the first guy I conflict, I actually can't commit. So I got to undo all my work and roll it back. Whereas in two-phase locking, you have to you get, you know, get the locks as you go along, so you would never, you would never actually do that. So the, basically, the research shows that when you have a lot of conflicts, two-phase locking and OCC basically are degenerative cases of each other. They're exactly the same. right? Two-phase locking, you basically spin, trying to acquire locks forever. And OCC, you can end up spinning because you're applying a bunch of changes, rolling back, and aborting, restarting, and over again. So under like, the extremely high contention, they're basically the same. One's not better than another. 
But when there's low contention, the research shows that something that's optimistic actually is better. And where do you find that sweet spot depends on the application. All right, so again, the OCC performance issues are that uh, we have high overhead for having copying data locally again. Uh, the validation phase can be a bottleneck unless you parallelize it. Even then, though, it still is, uh, you still have multiple threads trying to update the same, same state of the database at the same time. And again, as I said, when you have a lot of aborts, they're more expensive to do in the context of OCC than our two-phase locking uh, if you only find out that you have a conflict at the very end, right? Because you're doing this validation phase after you've already applied the changes you want to apply. Okay. So another observation we can make about OCC is that when the transaction goes to commit, you have to check to see whether there's, there's a conflict with other transactions. This means you have to use latches to protect the internal data structures of the transactions, because now one thread might be writing something at the same time you're reading it. Right? So if you have a lot of, comp a lot of concurrent transactions, even if conflicts are rare, at the logical level, like logically meaning they're not actually updating the same tuple, but physically they could all be still going to the same, you know, small number of data structures. Because I have to read them to figure out what, what you, I have to read your data structure, your workspace to figure out what you've actually written to. So I'll take, I have to take latches to do that. So to do that though, again, when you have a lot of transactions, this could be very expensive to do. Another way to think about it is you, you guys did your, your, your latch crabbing in your B plus tree, even if you don't have conflicts on the keys, you're taking latches in order to enter the, the data structure to make sure that the, 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 the internal representation is physically sound. So again, that all becomes very expensive. So an alternative approach is to actually have transactions execute in, in serial order, like literally one after other physically, and get rid of all the low-level latching you have for your data structures, for your B plus tree, or hash tables, whatever. And not worry about any conflicts between transactions as well. Because again, you're running in a single-threaded mode. Only one transaction can run at a time. There can never be a conflict. So this is what partition-based timestamp ordering does. So the basic idea is that we're going to split up the database into disjoint subsets called partitions, which we talked about before, horizontal partitions. If you're in the NoSQL world, these are called shards. And then for every single partition, we're going to have, we're going to assign timestamps to transactions when they show up. And then when it, your timestamp is the, is the smallest one out of, out of all the transactions waiting for that partition, it's your turn to run. Right? And then you can run in a single threaded mode and not worry about conflicts with anybody else, both physically and logically. You're basically only running at, almost running at like bare metal speed here. Because there's no overhead of a lock manager, no overhead of latching. So the first thing I understand, we need to understand is how can this actually work, right? How can you know? It seems like this be a uh, a slow thing to do because I'm running transactions, you know, in, in with a single thread. So the way again, what, the way we're going to uh, parallelize this is through partitioning. And when we look at a lot of applications for old P environments. They're actually quite amenable to partitioning and actually makes it using this particular protocol actually feasible. So let's look at a really simple schema here for something like Amazon. Right, we have three tables. We have, like, they were, you know, it's a storefront for, for an online uh, you know, sh shopping system. We have a customer table, we have orders, and we have order items. So a customer has orders and orders have order items. So we have foreign key dependencies going up the chain between these two tables here. So what we can end up doing is, as I said before, most of the time for your transactions on Amazon, you're updating only your account. Actually, you are only updating your account because I can't, you know, I can't from log into my account and start updating your payment records, or your, your credit card information. I can only update mine, right? The application enforces this. So what I can do now is recognize here is that I have a customer ID all the way down through, through my hierarchy here. So if I partition, my tables based on this customer ID, then I can allow transactions that only have to touch one customer to run at a single partition in this single threaded mode. So visually it looks something like this. So say I have two partitions, right? Whether this is on different machines or on the same machine, different cores, different sockets, 
I don't care, right? So the partition at the top is going to have customers 1 to 1,000. The partition to the bottom is going to have partitions 100,001 to 2,000. So now my application server issues a request, and it wants to touch partition uh, customer in, 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 in partition, the first partition. I send my request, I call begin, I, I start my transaction, and then I can update. Uh, it's, it's missing a little thing here, sorry. It should say get customer ID 1. So I can update customer ID 1, and then I go ahead and commit. And at no point did my transaction ever have to communicate with this other partition here. Right? So having this single threaded mode for this particular type of workload is actually uh, can make things run really, really fast. Because I don't have to worry about locking of tuples, and I don't have to worry about latching of data structures. So this partition-based uh, timestamp ordering is used in a couple systems. Um, it's an old idea that was first proposed in the, the late 1980s, early 1990s. right? Um, and again, the idea is that when a transaction shows up, you get a timestamp. And then when it's your, you have the lowest timestamp, then you're allowed to run. So this is sort of like a locking scheme, but it's not like two-phase locking. Right? There's only one giant lock for the partition. And when my timestamp is the lowest, then I get it. So this works really well if you only touch one partition. If you have to touch multiple partitions, then I have to wait. I, have to, I can't run my transaction until I acquire all the locks for the partitions I need to touch. Of course, now this means that I need to know what my partitions are ahead of time. So uh, the, the oldest system that actually does this is KDB from it's a, it's a financial time series database out of, out of New York. Um, HStore is a system I helped build when I was in grad school. This was later then commercialized as VoltDB. HStore was also worked on by a professor at, at University of Maryland called Dan Abadi, who when he was at Yale, he invented a system called Calvin, which is sort of doing a variant of this. And that's, that idea has been since commercialized in, in FaunaDB, which is a, a newer startup. Right? And again, in all these systems, uh, actually for KDB, I don't think it works this way, but for Fauna and VoltDB and HDR, you have to know what the partitions are ahead of time right? in order to, to know what you need to lock before you're allowed to run. Because otherwise, if I run and I'm running a partition 1 and I say, oh, sh partition 2, I can't just go grab the lock for it because that might, might put me in a deadlock. I have to abort my transaction, roll back, and come back and say, give me one and two. And then when my timestamp is the lowest at both those partitions, then I'm allowed to run. Right, so again, for reads, I can read anything at the partition I hold the locks for. Right? And the, the second part is exactly what I said. If I try to read something at a partition I don't hold the lock for, then I have to get abort it and restart it. For writes, same thing. Uh, I only have to have a single version. I don't have a private workspace. I have to maintain an undo buffer to keep track of the changes I made. So I to, if I abort my transaction, I have to roll them back. But I don't have a private workspace. I can overwrite exactly the, the master version of, of, of the tuple. And again, if I try to write to something that I don't hold the lock for, I get aborted. So visually, it looks like this. So say we have now two servers, two, uh, one and two. We have two, two partitions and a partition on the customer table by the customer ID. And then say that these two transactions want to both start, a, both servers want to start a transaction on the first server here. So again, there's this queue that's going to keep track of when these requests show up. And you're going to assign them timestamps, right? So server one's request gets timestamp 100, server two gets timestamp 101. And then whatever transaction has the, high, has the smallest timestamp is now granted the lock for this partition. And it's allowed to run and do whatever it wants. Right, so they can do can get customer ID one, do whatever changes it wants. Then it goes ahead and commits, and now there's no validation. There's no checking to see whether I have any conflicts because there can't be any conflicts because only one transaction was running at this time. So I go ahead and commit. Now the second request here becomes the the the, the oldest timestamp. So then it's given the lock, and then it's allowed to run and do whatever that it wants to do. All right, so we're doing locking here, but again, we're not doing two-phase locking because the timestamps are telling us when, in what order we have to acquire the locks. There's one additional thing I'm not talking about here as well is that since I may need to touch data at two partitions, I have to send two requests to those two, two different partitions to get those timestamps or get the locks for them. And so before I'm allowed to say, all right, you're now the oldest timestamp, go ahead and start running, I have to put, wait a little bit, like five milliseconds, to see whether anybody else is going to show up with a timestamp that's less than me. 
and therefore they should have been given the lock. But if now, if I give this lock to 101, and somebody shows up now with timestamp 99, it, that timestamp 99 transaction is going to get aborted because I, the timestamps always have to be going forward in time. So I missed my window, I couldn't acquire the lock, and I had to come back and, and try again with a higher timestamp. So again, this is super, super fast. If you don't, uh, if you don't have to touch the data at, 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 at multiple partitions, if you only touch the data at one partition, because you don't need latching in your indexes, you don't have any latching in your data structure, your buffer hole manager, everything is super fast. Of course, now the downside is, in my example, I was showing these network round trips, right? I was beginning the transaction, then sending requests, getting response, then going commit. If you're going over the network with those round trips, that's actually going to be really slow because now the data system is basically idle at that partition, waiting for your response over the network. So the way systems like HStore or VoltDB get around this is that you have to run all your transactions as store procedures. Right, so now there's no, no network round trip. Everything runs really fast inside the machine. Calvin and Fauna do something differently. They basically run your transaction once, figure out all your reads and writes in sort of this reconnaissance mode. Then when you go to commit, then you actually run it for real and see whether your reads and writes actually match what you had before. So that allows you to figure out what you, what you were going to touch ahead of time. Yes? His statement is, can we view this as a type of lock escalation? What do you mean? So, like, in a, so we're, we're doing this because we don't want to issue a lot of lock requests, right? Uh, correct, yes. And, and latching. We don't want to have, you know, we don't have to protect our data structures anymore. Yeah. So, like, uh, in the locks, we only have, like, a, a, a whole DB level or a tuple level and the, like, the tuple level. Mm -hmm. So, if we just, like, group a tu some tuples together, and uh, let's see, we can lock these tubos all at once. So is that like kind of an equivalent to this approach? All right, so I, w so I wouldn't call it escalation. Escalation means I have a shared lock, and I want like a, um, I want like a write lock. Um, yes, you can think of like a bunch of tubos as being a partition, and that would fit in your hierarchy, right? A table can have partitions, yeah. but the sort of difference about this is like within a partition, there's multiple tables. So in my example here. My first partition here has both the, all the, the, the customer's orders and order item records where the customer ID is within this range. So it's not quite the same as the hierarchy that we talked about last time. Okay, so again, VoltDB guys are coming at the end of the semester and they'll talk about this, this protocol more. This works great for transactions. You can't run any faster than this, right, because it's single-threaded, single-versioned. Uh, it does not work well for analytical queries if you have to touch multiple data at multiple partitions and you want to run that in serializable mode because now you're holding basically locks for the entire database or multiple partitions. Okay. So this is the stuff that we, we skipped last time. So one thing to point out is that everything we talked about the last three classes have assumed that we have transactions that are just reading and writing data and we didn't worry about doing any inserts. We didn't worry about doing any deletions. Right? We didn't worry about the, the, the number of tuples changing in, in our tables. But if you start doing that, then you have problems that two-phase locking and timestamp ordering actually don't solve. So let's look at an example here. So now instead of showing reads and writes, I'm actually showing SQL queries. So the first guy is going to T1 is going to start and say, give me the max, the, the, the max age of all from all from the people table where their status is lit right let's say that there's some 70 year old gimmer and his he's lit right so we the value we get back is 72. but then we can do a context switch t2 starts and it inserts a record where the age of somebody that's lit is 96. now i come back and do my same query as before and i get 96 not 72. So would two-phase locking solve this problem? I've already said no, but why? Say you're locking at the tuple level, right? I can't lock a tuple here that doesn't exist, right? So this is called, a, a, this is, this is type of a, 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 an anomaly called a phantom. And this occurs because T1 can only lock things that, that it knows that, that exists when it reads, when it runs. And another transaction comes along, starts inserting and deleting stuff, 
and things start disappearing, right, th that can cause problems. So complex serializability in the way that we talked about so far only works for individual items, right? If the number of objects are fixed, if you start doing more complicated things like counts and aggregations and other things like that, two-phase locking will not help you. So the way we, so there's a couple different ways to solve this. One is to do what's called predicate locking. And the idea here is that instead of actually locking like I want lock tuple A, tuple B, I can declare a predicate that I would have my where clause for my query and say I want to lock anything that, that satisfies this predicate. Right? Even if it doesn't exist yet. Right? So in that my example before, I can do my do my lookup where status equals lit, and then now if I declare that as a predicate lock, anybody that tries to insert something that satisfies that predicate would not allow it to be able to proceed because I hold the lock for it. So this sounds like this is exactly solve our problem, and in theory, you would be correct. Uh, this is actually the ideas they came up with in the 1970s at IBM, but in, in, in practice, this is actually really hard to do, and nobody does this, right? Because again, for simple things like you know something equals something is fine, but when you start talking about ranges, conjunctions, and disjunctions, this becomes a big mess because it's sort of a multi-dimensional space, and you're trying to decide whether your predicate or whatever it is that you're trying to do intersects with you know, some predicate lock that somebody already holds. So nobody actually does this. Uh, the hyper guys, the German guys, do something very slightly similar to this, but not exactly the same. The, the general idea of I'm going to lock based on, on conditionals like this, nobody actually does. But we can actually rely on the indexes we built, the B plus trees, to actually do something that's very similar, or almost exactly the same thing. So the idea is that for, with index locking, we can start locking the individual nodes in our index and use that as a stand-in to doing predicate locks. So in this case here, status equals lit. I could find, if I have an index on status, I could find where all my entries are where, where status equals lit in my index, take a lock on that node in the index, and now that's essentially the same thing that, as, as taking the predicate lock. So again, it only works if the index is already created on the thing that you want to take a lock on, right? Where things get tricky now is if there's no record with status equals lit in your index, then you end up having to take a virtual lock to say, had I had, I had a record that said status equals lit, here's the location of where it actually would be, like the gap of where it would actually occur. And you can take locks on, on those individual things. And again, when I say lock, again, I, I'm talking at, at a physical level inside the index, but it falls under the same logical locking protocol of two-phase locking. So I have either deadlock prevention or deadlock detection to make sure everything, everything turns out okay. If I don't have an index already created, I can't do this. The alternative was then just to be uh, take a lock on every single page in time, my entire table and prevent anybody else from inserting something while I'm doing my scan. Of course, that's not actually feasible, right? Um, I could also take a lock on the page and prevent anybody from, you can, you can, you can read things, but you, can, you can't do any uh, inserts or, or, or deletes. You can update things, and I can check that as you go along. But again, nobody, as far as I know, nobody actually does this. The third approach is to just do what are called repeating scans. So basically, when I go to commit, either in two-phase locking or timestamp ordering, I just rerun all the scans that I actually did when, I, when my transaction ran, see if I get back the same result. If I do, then I know that nobody else has changed anything, and I'm allowed to go ahead and commit. If I don't, then I know that somebody inserted something that I didn't see that I should have seen, and therefore I have to roll back and restart. So the only commercial system that I know that actually does this last approach is uh, Hecaton, which is an in-memory storage engine for, for Microsoft SQL Server. Right? They, they essentially do the same thing. Um, it's an option, though. And then Silo is an academic system out of Harvard that does, does, it, it does this. So I also mentioned this last class. So, so this is an example of, of, a, of an anomaly called a phantom. I read something that wasn't there, and then I read it again, and it, and it appears. 
And I sh that shouldn't happen if I'm running in, ser in serializable isolation level. But as I said, the dirty secret about transactions in the real world is that most systems don't actually, most applications don't actually run in serializable isolation mode. Right? So serializable isolation is sort of the most strictest thing because it'll generate uh, schedules. It is actually not the most strictest, but for our purposes, it is. Uh, it generates things in, 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 you know, that's equivalent to a serial ordering. Uh, but enforcing that can be really expensive. And as, as we saw, if we have conflicts that violate that, that serializable ordering, we end up having to abort transactions and that ends up being wasted work. But in reality, in a lot of cases, some applications are okay with with conflicts, because it won't actually affect the correctness of what's going on. So this is where isolation levels come in. So isolation levels are going to allow you to control what behaviors transactions are allowed to see, or what anomalies or conflicts that are transactions are allowed to potentially see. So, and the reason why you want to run at a lower isolation level is because you're going to allow transactions to to have more parallelism. Because the data system is not going to worry about, oh, you know, you shouldn't be able to read that. Let me kill you. Right? He says, yeah, you can go ahead and read it. That's fine. So we've already talked about dirty reads and unrepeatable reads. And then the example that I just had now with the status and the index locking, this is an example of a phantom read. Right? I'm reading something that, that was there, and now it's not there if I try to read it again. Or I, I did a scan on a range, and things you know, pop in and pop out within that range. So the... I'm saying no, but no is in green, because that sort of, from an from a academic standpoint, that means a good thing, right, that you don't have these anomalies. Um, and then instead of saying yes, I'm saying maybe, because it depends on what other transactions are running at the same time. It also slightly depends on how the data system actually implements uh, these isolation levels. We don't have time for a demo we'll, right now, we'll do this next class, but like in the case of Postgres, you can tell it I want to, want to run un, read uncommitted, but it actually won't, right? Because it, it, the way Postgres implements this actually won't let you actually do this, right? They, the Postgres would have to have to do extra work to make it so it actually is true read uncommitted. And that's stupid. Like, who cares, right? You're sort of getting something for free. So the way you're actually going to implement this in the context of least, context of least two phase locking is that for serializable isolation, you do all, you have to obtain all the locks first, plus the index locks to avoid the phantoms we talked about before, plus doing strict 2 PL. If you do all those three things, then you get serializable for free, or not for free, they get serializable isolation level, and this is what we've talked about so far. If you want to have repeatable reads but not serializable, then you don't do the index locks because you don't care about the phantom example that I showed before. Then as, again, as you go down, you turn off, you turn off more and more stuff. So the way to set this when you run transactions, you can do this in two ways. You have the, the, the set command, or if you begin a transaction, you can tell what isolation level you want to start with. Um, I think this is in the SQL standard. Uh, most systems, except for MySQL, at least 5.7, will support this. I don't think SQLite supports this, right? And as I said, not all systems actually will support all these isolation levels. Some of them will lie to you and tell you that, yes, I have serializable isolation level, but I'm really at a lower scheme or lower isolation level. Oracle does this. Um, or some of them will lie to you and say, yes, you're running at the lower level, but you're, really actually, uh, you're actually at an upper level. And the only way you actually know whether what level you're really at 
based on the textbook definition of these anomalies, is, is reading the manual, right? There's also some other scenarios where when you start looking at distributed systems, that it maybe it'll have run at one isolation level when all your transactions touch a single box, but if you touch another machine, it'll run at a lower isolation level. Right? These things get very complicated very quickly. So this is a table that uh, Peter Bayless, who's a professor at Stanford, came up with it at, on his blog in 2013. And he basically looked at a bunch of you know, very popular database systems and said, what, you know, what is the default isolation level that they provide, and what's the maximum isolation level that they provide? So the first thing to point out is that only two of them, Ingress and VoltDB, by default give you serializable isolation level. Right? So VoltDB, at least last I checked, you actually can't run at a lower isolation level. It won't do this for you. For Ingress, I actually don't know. And I'll say both of these systems, both Ingress and, and VoltDB, were, you know, were companies founded by my, my PhD advisor, Mike Stonebreaker. And so he loves, you know, he's an academic who built database systems and went for serializable. Everybody else is running at a lower isolation level, right? Most of them are running recommitted. My SQL runs at re re repeatable reads, which is actually more stricter. And again, for a lot of applications, this is fine, right? You know, Facebook is running at repeatable reads. You know, one, one of the largest MySQL, it is the largest MySQL installation in the world. And for them, that's fine. In terms of maximum isolation level, again, some of them support serializable, some of them don't. Uh, the one thing to point out here, though, is Oracle, their highest isolation level is this thing called snaps of isolation. We'll talk about this in the next class. But again, this is, I don't think you can declare I want snapshot isolation in SQL. Right? You say you want serializable isolation level, but what actually get, ends up giving you is something lower called snapshot isolation. And the, the details of this don't actually matter. The last thing we can do is also provide hints to our database system for transactions and say what, whether our transaction is going to actually modify the database or not. Right? And so when you start a transaction, you can say you want it to be in uh, a read-only mode or a read-write mode. And in the case, if you go into read-only mode and you try to do an update, the, da the database system will recognize that you shouldn't, you're not allowed to do that and abort you and, and roll you back. And the reason why you want to do this is because if you can tell the database system ahead of time, I'm going to read read-only, then you don't have to do a bunch of the checks that we've talked about so far. You know, I don't need to maintain a write set. I don't need to worry about any transaction conflicting with me, potentially, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to modify the database. So this is like sort of select for update that I showed last class. This is an additional hint to the data system to allow it to, to improve parallelism. All right, any questions about isolation levels? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give demos on Postgres and MySQL next class. You'll see this in, in further detail when we start talking about multi-versioning. All right, so the, the main takeaway of all this is that basically from the last two classes, two-phase locking, timestamp ordering, Every concurrent serial protocol that I'm aware of and that is in the literature has to be one of these two types, right? You're either going to use timestamps to figure out what the order of things ahead of time, or you can use two-phase locking or locks to prevent people from accessing stuff before they're allowed to touch it, right? The other thing I didn't include in this lecture is any benchmark results, because I don't want to give you the wrong idea that one protocol is actually better than another. It depends on the application. It depends on the implementation. So we'll look at some examples next class. Uh, to also show you that it's not just the concurrent protocol that matters, but it's all this other stuff that actually how you implement your system will affect the, the runtime performance for transactions. Right? If you have a crappy index, if you have a crappy B plus tree, then your, all your transactions are going to run really, really slow, no matter whether you're doing two-phase locking or, or time stamp ordering. So there's a lot of other factors that are involved in, in determining whether one protocol will be better than another for an application. OK? All right. Next class, we'll talk about multi-version concurrent control. This is another confusing aspect of this because there's no protocol called multi-version concurrent control protocol. There, there is, but there isn't. So multi-versioning is the idea of just maintaining different versions of transactions or of objects inside of our database. Sort of think of like this as the private workspace you saw for OCC, but instead of just having one, you know, one private workspace and then the, the global database, we can have multiple versions all over the place. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes! It's the SP Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here comes Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. Oh.
Bentley's on the cup, say I'm a fool cause I drink brew Quick to bust a cap on the eyes, bro Bushwick gonna go with a blow to the eyes, Here I come, Willie D, that's me Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park and South Central, G And St. Eyes when I party By the 12-pack case of the 40 A six-pack 40 act gets the real bounce I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce They say Bill makes you fat But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter <laughs> 